non-upgradable, you say? Well, let's have a look about that. Today, we're going to upgrade the MacBook Air. Um, it's from 2015 and I want to upgrade the memory on it. This is onboard memory and this is not, generally speaking, user replaceable or you can't just stick a new stick of RAM in it and then be done like you would in a older style Mac or laptop. And the reason I want to do that is my girlfriend is a elementary school teacher and her school provides laptops for fifth graders and onward. And as you might guess, she is going to teach a fourth grade. And that means that she won't have laptops for her students, but still obviously wants to be able to have them do some basic research, maybe PowerPoint, something like that. And if you know anything about teachers, um, it's the only job where you're stealing pens at home and not at work. And that means we have to pay for it, basically. And that's the reason why we want to do it on the cheap. I bought this MacBook Air as broken. It had some corrosion issues, rather boring. It works now, but it has only four gigabytes of memory. And to demonstrate that, like basic, really, really basic stuff, like opening a YouTube video, just takes time. And it's not because uh, we have crappy internet here, it's because this machine is just so underpowered or it has not enough memory. And my hope is that after this upgrade, this machine will be a lot snappier and nicer to work with. Even if we go full screen, it just take, everything takes a couple of seconds until it actually does it. And that's not a really nice user experience, is it? Unlike the memory upgrade I showed on this channel with like normal memory sticks. This time around, these uh, MacBook Airs use uh, LPDDR3. And that is a bit unfortunate in the sense that you won't find them on like memory sticks or anything of that sort. So one way to obtain these memory chips, is either you buy them from your usual suspects, AliExpress, eBay, or some other sites. Unfortunately, you can't buy it from like the uh, DigiKey, Mauser, or any of these uh, brands you have to go to, as I said, AliExpress, eBay, and so on. That's one way. The other way is from that main board. That's what I did here. That's uh, 2015, MacBook Air 2015. Has a broken processor in it, won't work again. But um, it's still very useful as a parts donor because that was an 8 gigabyte model. And I harvested these chips and we're going to put them into this machine. And after we soldered the memory chips in, we have to do some adjustments in the straps. And if you have seen my video about the 1050 upgrade, there I also did a strap mod. It's basically the same. These straps tell the BIOS or the computer what memory is installed, how much memory is installed, how fast it is and so on. And then from there, everything gets configured. Again, unlike with these um, normal sticks of RAM, you have an SPD chip here. That's not the case with uh, MacBook Airs. They're the SPD in the firmware or BIOS. So we want to remove the donor chips. I will use the hot air station, 420 degrees Celsius, 110 liters of flow, some flux, and um, yeah, let's remove them. So first, don't put chunk on it. Just apply a liberal amount of flux since it always helps. And I will, I don't use the nozzle again. I want the widest possible airflow. So let's remove that and just use it spare. Um, that the chips are um, removed. We need to clean them, remove the old solder and uh, clean a bit of the flux away and then they're ready to be reballed.
one. Let's solder it back on. Uh, orientation of the chips. Uh, the dots on the chip need to be on the this corner here. And then, um, yeah, let's go. Let's talk about straps. Now, with the straps, we can config the memory. And how that's done is the CPU reads the voltage on the straps. And that might look something like this. So RAM config 0 is low, RAM config 1 is high, 2 high, 3 low. And what that means is that the CPU can, or the BIOS, or wherever the lookup table is, um, it can be deducted what memory vendor is used. So, for example, if RAM config 0 is low and RAM config 1 or strap 1 is high, it might be Samsung. 1 0 might be Hynix, 0 0 might be Alpida. Um, please note this, uh, this is all um, mock up data because I'm not allowed to show unpublished um, data sheets but you will have to look it up in the schematics of the, uh, your MacBook. And it's the same with the last two straps. There, the size is defined. So uh, if RAM config 2 is high and 3 is low, that means it's um, 8 gigabyte. Yeah, again, it's mock-up data, but um, you get the point. You define the size with the last two straps. And as I said, this might mean 8 gigabyte of Samsung memory or 4 gigabyte of Alpida memory. But how do we get to this low high on these strap lines? And for that, we have to have a look at the schematics. Again, I'm not allowed to show it, but I made a mock up. And this might look something like this. Each strap is uh, consists of two resistors, a pull up and a pull down resistor. So in this instance for RAM config zero or strap zero, the R1611 is a pull up resistor and the R2053 is a pull down resistor. And obviously if you have it like this, where every, where every resistor or every strap resistor is um, populated, we have everything is low because we have a 10K pull down resistor and a 100k pull up. So that will get you something like 0.3 volts, since this is basically a 1 to 10 volt divider. And that will be read as low. So in reality, it will look something like this, where you have only populated one pad for each strap. So either it's pulled up or pulled down. This is the stock config that I had. As you can see, it's for each strap pair, it's only one resistor populated. Now, if you have a look at the old config and the new config, Config, we see that we need to change the RAM config 2 or strap 2 from low to high. And that means we have to add a pull up resistor to 3.3 volt here. And we have to remove the pull down resistor because that would pull it down to ground. And we get a voltage divider again, something like 0.3 volts. And if you do it, you might have to change different parameters. So say you want to switch from Samsung to Hynix memory, you will also have to change uh, strap 0 and 1 and so on. But the gist of it is they always come in pairs and you have to change a pair of them. You can't just change one resistor, you always have to do it in pairs. So let's have a look why we don't have to edit the BIOS. With all the style MacBooks, it was necessary to edit the BIOS and DOS Dude 1 did a great video about that. But in our case, we don't need to. And the reason why we don't need to is um, we can search for the first four or three um, characters of the product number of the chips. So this is a hex pattern. This is K4B or something like that, just the first four uh, characters or three characters. And the reason why I do it in hex is either I'm not competent in using the software um, or there is a bug that you can't search for text strings, I don't know. Anyways, we can search for that and then we have some results. And if we have a look at the first one, this looks awfully like an SPD file. Now it doesn't seem to be like completely standard, but um, from the looks of it, it looks very much like a SPD file. And we can look further. Another one. And this one is uh, the part number for our new chips. So there is 
an SPD file for our new chips after the update. There are also others, like this one here is probably the 16GB, uh, EM could be LPDA, I don't know. If we look at the very bottom, we have a file here, memory config. If you go to the hex view, we can see that still the old uh, chips are in this file. And the reason for that is I took the dump before uh, the upgrade, so it's still vanilla. But I also took one afterwards and then this changed with the straps. So the straps really tell the BIOS or the, the firmware what kind of uh, SPD should be loaded in this case. Um, it's uh, the BIOS loaded this one here, but if we have another strap config there, the another file will be loaded or will be used. And that's the reason why we don't need to edit it because it's already there. But now that we know why it works, um, let's have a look at how it works and how it compares to before the upgrade and um, if all this trouble was actually worth it or not. So as you can see, 4 8 gigabytes of memory is detected here. We can have a look at the system report. Two banks with 4 GB of memory, 1600 MHz, DDR3, so everything seems to work. That's very nice, but what about the performance? Let's open YouTube. And you can see it's uh, much, much faster this time around. We can skip in the video. Works nicely, full screen, again, a lot faster, a lot snappier. And this is only with one tap, right? The 4 gigabyte machine, it struggles with one tap open. This time around, at least with one tap and the video in HD, it seems to work somewhat well. That's quite a bit of an improvement, even if you have a look like... So opening maps took quite a bit of time with the 4 gigabyte machine and here, it's pretty much instant. So I'd say the overall performance of the machine or the snappiness or the user experience greatly improved with this upgrade from the point where, yeah, I mean, not unusable, but not nice to use to, yeah, it's, it's okay for an everyday machine, I guess. I mean, obviously we didn't change the processor and that's i5, 1.6 gigahertz dual core, it's not a great process, but it's enough for like everyday work. And at least for me, this saved the machine from being scrapped basically. So if this video was uh, interesting to you, um, please consider to subscribe. If you have questions, please ask them. I do my best to answer them. Uh, I have more videos um, with memory upgrades from graphics cards, fixing videos. So yeah, have a look at that anyways. I hope you have a nice day and see you next time.